This video is kindly sponsored by HelloFresh. Find out more later in the video. Hey, 42 here. Consider for a moment the modern day city of Liverpool, the 10th largest city in England by primary urban area with a busy international port. Now, imagine if I told you that in 200 years, Liverpool would be almost entirely underwater. Don't worry if you're a Merseysider, you aren't going to wake up tomorrow and see sharks circling the Liver building. Well, you might do one day, but more on that later. However, this was the exact watery fate of the bustling medieval town of Dunwich. Like Liverpool today, in the 11th century, Dunwich was England's 10th largest city. Like Liverpool, it was a busy commercial port with ships coming and going to and from multiple continents. By the end of the 13th century, this prosperous international city had almost entirely disappeared. Today, Dunwich's population is a tiny 183, and visitors are greeted by a couple of streets, a handful of houses, a windswept beach, a single pub, and a museum that tells the town's woeful tale. You see, Dunwich, is the town that drowned. No matter what's going on in the world, everyone needs to eat. That's why HelloFresh is here to make eating better and easier. By eliminating the dreaded grocery shop and stressful meal planning, HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun and easy by delivering everything you need to prepare wholesome, delicious meals right to your door. HelloFresh recipes are so delicious. Every recipe is packed with high quality, fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. They have a huge selection of recipes with more five-star choices than any other meal kit. I especially enjoyed the chicken laksa and the roast chicken with vegetables. HelloFresh saves you time and stress. I'm guilty of working endless hours and I can easily let time slip away from me. So it was honestly so refreshing and relaxing to know my dinner was solved. The recipes were super easy to follow and rapid to prepare and cook. HelloFresh is flexible. You can easily change your delivery days or food preferences. Their meals are healthy and fulfilling and you can add extras to your delivery such as quick lunches, extra proteins or their yummy garlic bread. Personally, I loved having HelloFresh in my life when I tried it it was easy, healthy, and delicious, and I couldn't wait for dinner each night. And I know you'll love it too. So if you want to experience just how great HelloFresh is, head to hellofresh.com and use code 4212 to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. To understand just how important Dunwich was in its heyday, let's take a brisk stroll down Anglo-Saxon history lane. Because before the end of the 10th century, 927 AD to be precise, England as a nation didn't really exist. Instead, it was a patchwork of independent kingdoms, which were often at war either with each other or against Viking invaders. An Anglo-Saxon from Dorset on the south coast wouldn't recognize someone from Durham in the north as being of the same nation. Whilst they shared the Anglo-Saxon language, their dialects were so different that communication would have involved a lot of guesswork and grunts. There were seven main Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Northumbria stretched from the Scottish border all the way down to the Midlands. From there, Mercia encompassed the entire Midlands down to London. Then the southern kingdoms were divided between Wessex in the, you guessed it, West. Kent and Essex in the east, and finally, there was the Kingdom of the East Angles, or East Anglia. And so, we return to England's lost city. Dunwich, with a population of 4,500, was East Anglia's largest port and the kingdom's capital city. It rivaled London, both in size and importance. Even after Ethelstan united the kingdoms to create England in 927 AD, Dunwich retained its importance. In fact, it was granted a royal charter in 1199, which gave it an official governmental structure, 
with magistrates, bailiffs, and a coroner. The etymology of the city's name gives us an interesting insight into its importance as a centre of commerce. The sharpest amongst you will have noticed Dunwich has a W in it, and you may therefore presume I am, rather typically, pronouncing it with all the elegance of a drunk ape. But in fact, the which suffix in English place names comes from the Old English word WIC, which was confusingly pronounced witch, and it meant trading centre or harbour. So, if you ever see the which suffix, you can probably assume that place was an important centre of trade, like Dunwich. As for why the W is now silent, well, that's just because us English are lazy gits, and due to a linguistic process known as elision, it was dropped from normal conversation over time to make it easier to pronounce. So then, what passed through Dunwich's busy port? Local wool and grain would have been the primary exports, whilst imports consisted mostly of luxuries from the continent, including French wine and Flemish fabric. But Dunwich's trade routes extended as far as the Middle East. Bitumen found at the famous Sutton Hoo 7th century burial site, around 20 miles from Dunwich, has been shown to be of Syrian origin. And spices, particularly pepper, were surprisingly common in Anglo-Saxon cuisine, at least for the wealthy, and this exotic delicacy very likely graced the ports of Dunwich. Dunwich was also home to a busy fishing fleet, with unimpeded access to the plentiful North Sea. While some of the town's boats were relegated to seeking sprats and herring in local fishing grounds, others would have travelled as far as Iceland. As a seafaring town, Dunwich was also a centre of shipbuilding. Whilst many of the ships built in Dunwich would have been trade or fishing vessels, warships were also constructed in its harbour. Boats built in Dunwich would have been used in epic Saxon and Viking battles in the North Sea, with the town's harbour itself being an essential cog in the realm's coastal defences. In 1229, King Henry III ordered 40 warships to be built in Dunwich, as he put it, well equipped with all kinds of armament, which in 1230 constituted a large portion of the fleet that left from Portsmouth and travelled to attack France under his leadership. If you visit Dunwich today, you can see the remains of a leper hospital, along with the ruins of Greyfriars Monastery. The last of the town's churches fell off the edge of the cliff and into the sea in 1919, and it's said that if you sit on Dunwich Beach at low tide, and listen carefully, you'll hear Dunwich's church bells ringing from beneath the waves. But today, there's much more than just an old rusty bell beneath the sea in these parts. In fact, there's a whole city. That prosperous medieval city I just described, well, it now sits at the bottom of the North Sea. All of it which has caused many to name Dunwich Britain's Atlantis. Because you know what us British are like, we've got to have a little version of bloody everything. But this begs the question, how did such a large, for the day, and important city become little more than an artificial coral reef? It began gradually, with Dunwich's impressive natural harbour being slowly buffeted and battered by the brutal North Sea waves, even whilst Dunwich was growing fast and building ships to send out across the world, it was already beginning to sink. According to the Doomsday Book, half of Dunwich's farmland was taken by the waves in the short 20 years between 1066 and 1086. Even in its heyday, the writing was already on the wall for Dunwich. We know that the coast along the stretch of Suffolk, where the remains of Dunwich now sit, erodes at around a metre a year. Don't think that sounds like much? Well, it means that the shoreline now lies around two kilometres further inland than it did in Roman times. That's about the length of London's Oxford Street. All this means that by the 13th century, the North Sea was already encroaching quite seriously on Dunwich. At the same time, however, the people of Dunwich believed they could defend it, 
They did, after all, have a town that was more than worth defending, of national and even international importance. Just as London, Liverpool, Hull and other port cities today protect themselves with sea defences, so did Dunwich. But the scrabble to stay above water got increasingly difficult and desperate, with houses already standing right on the cliff's edge. You see, Dunwich was not suffering simply from normal coastal erosion. The natural harbour that had brought the town all its prosperity was partly created by King's Home, a sand and shingle spit that ran for around four kilometres. As this moved along the coast and eventually disappeared, so the sea channels that linked harbour, river and sea began to disappear too. And with them, Dunwich's natural harbour. Throughout the 13th century, sea walls were built and then breached and then rebuilt as the town of Dunwich came under ever greater attack from the forces of nature. In 1250, a large storm and unusually high tide moved the King's home spit and diverted the River Blythe. This was a big problem. Ships departing Dunwich used this river to sail out to sea. No longer able to do so, the people of Dunwich, keen to protect their livelihoods, laboriously dug a new channel out to sea. Sadly, that hard work was all but wasted. Just 36 years later, in 1286, many of those who built that channel would still have been alive to witness Dunwich's fate, all but sealed. Another viciously high tide and a strong easterly storm devastated the town. Not only did the seawater flood through its streets, houses and churches, it took a chunk of the town with it. A strip of land around 100 metres wide was carried off into the North Sea. In 1328, there was yet another brutal storm that's all but ended Dunwich, both as a town and as a port. Two monasteries were almost totally swept into the sea, along with numerous houses. And it didn't just lose houses. The King's home spit moved again, completely blocking Dunwich's already dying harbour. With no easy access for boats, Dunwich's entire reason for being was no more, and no income from the harbour's toll booth meant no money for any more fruitless attempts at building sea walls and defences. And thus Dunwich became a shadow of its former glory, sitting solemnly along the battered coast, just waiting to die. And with every storm, more of it did. In 1347, 400 houses and two churches were swept away. As each chunk of cliff fell into the sea, it took with it parts of Dunwich and its history. With each disappearing churchyard, the bones of people buried there could be seen sticking out of the cliff. This once prosperous capital city was fast turning into an open air cemetery. Dunwich's disappearance continued. Though stubborn Dunwiches continued to live there, despite the apparently constant risk of suddenly drowning and the lack of any obvious industry to replace its once bustling port, it's even thought that new houses were built in Dunwich just as parts of it continue to fall off the cliff edge. A 1587 map shows Dunwich as half the size it was in 1200, but it also shows new buildings that weren't part of the medieval town. You have to admire the tenacity of its residents to have a sea view. By the 20th century, the entirety of the once thriving international medieval port of Dunwich had sunk into the sea. All that's left today of the medieval town are a few ruined sections of the leper hospital because it was built deliberately away from the town centre, and one of its monasteries, which was built in the late 13th century to replace an earlier building that had been taken by the sea. Only divers ever get close to seeing anything more of medieval Dunwich, and doing that is a difficult and dangerous task. Stuart Bacon, marine archaeologist and director of the Suffolk Underwater Studies Unit, has been diving into Dunwich's murky waters since 1971, even though much of the town is just a few metres under the surface, it's rare that he and his team of divers can see anything at all. 
In 1,000 dives, Bacon has only seen further than a meter a handful of times. On most dives, he can see just one or two centimeters. Exploring the underwater town, not through sight, but by touch. We know that Dunwich is lost to the waves. No doubt the few streets it has left will join the rest of the town under the water in just a few decades time. But will there be another Dunwich? Another town disappearing entirely? Yes, almost certainly. Much of eastern England's coast is constantly eroding. It's one of the fastest eroding coastlines in Europe. And as in 14th century Dunwich, there are constant debates about what we should do about it. Sea defenses are usually erected and then breached and then shored up again at great expense. Yet houses still fall into the sea. In December 2013, a tidal surge and hurricane force winds caused floods along the whole of England's eastern coast. At Hemsby in Norfolk, seven houses fell dramatically and suddenly down the cliff to be claimed by the sea. Other villages along the East Anglian coast have already disappeared completely, such as Eccles on Sea in Norfolk, which was abandoned in the 17th century. Eastern Bavant, just a couple of miles north of Dunwich, has almost entirely disappeared. In Haysborough in Norfolk, there's another why the holy piss is that pronounced like that word for you. Water pipes that once ran to houses now protrude out from the cliffs, and a road to the coast now stops at a broken cliff edge. The reality is that there's not much we can do to stop this happening. We might be able to shore up defences in bigger towns for a while, but experts agree that trying to save everywhere indefinitely is impossible. We still don't know how much of this erosion we can blame on climate change and rising sea levels. Or perhaps it's just the natural symphony of storm damage, which is as old as the earth itself. But there is one thing we know. When the sea decides it doesn't like a piece of land and wants to remodel, there's little we can do to stop it. Let's for a moment look back way beyond the medieval period to the Stone Age. Dunwich then would have been the upper edge of a vast area of land that stretched from East Anglia to the Netherlands, known as Doggerland. If you've ever got so bleeding bored that you've listened to the shipping forecast, you might have heard that name. This now drowned world was once a gentle landscape of rolling hills, woodlands and swamps, where nomadic tribes roamed, hunted and fished, alongside a few wandering mammoths. Fishing trawlers still regularly bring up Stone Age tools and ancient mammoth bones from the seafloor in a net full of cod. In 2015, divers found the remains of a submerged forest in the sea off the coast of Norfolk. So really, it isn't Dunwich that's Britain's Atlantis, it's Doggerland. Doggerland was gradually flooded at the end of the last ice age, around 6500 BC, as ice sheets and glaciers flooded its low-lying plains. Its tribes were forced to higher ground, some of them, no doubt, ended up near Dunwich. It's also thought that a huge tsunami caused by a landslide in the Norwegian Sea may have sealed the deal and submerged Doggerland forever. Any Stone Age Doggerlanders who hadn't already run for safety were done for. And it might be that there's not that much we can do to stop even more of our land going the same way as Dunwich and Doggerland. Even cities that, like Dunwich, have put time, money and effort into sea defences might just be on very expensive borrowed time. The East Yorkshire city of Hull will, by some predictions, be completely underwater by 2050. Maybe 2040, if we're lucky. In 2007, large parts of the city were evacuated after floods. And in 2013, the city's main sea defence was just centimetres away from being breached. And it's not just Hull. The same fate might be waiting for large parts of Norfolk and Suffolk coasts and the Cambridgeshire Fens. Further afield, large parts of the Netherlands, Denmark and Belgium could be swept away within the next 30 years. 
And perhaps, in as little as a few decades from now, there could be many more churches ringing their ghostly bells from beneath the waves. Thanks for watching.